Thank you all for your patience. We have solved our technical issues. And now we will continue with the last presentation entitled Genre-Based Pedagogy at University. Uh, Maria Susana Gonzalez is a teacher of English, a BA in letters and anime in discourse analysis. At present, she's our TESO president and the director of the RTSO ESP journal. So please let us welcome Ms. Maria Susana Gonzalez. Right. Uh, uh, please, uh, I cannot uh, change uh, the slide, so I think you have to do it. Yes, could you hear you can, me? You can do so with the arrows, with your keyboard arrows. Yes, but I can't. I can't. Probably because I, I didn't share it. Okay, we were going to help you over here. Okay, please, next. I will tell you when you, you want, when I want to change it. Well, thank you. Well, hello, everybody. <laughs> If there is somebody there after 10 minutes waiting for me. All right. Um, the aim of the, this presentation is uh, to show the basic tenets of the jungle based literacy pedagogy developed by the Sydney School and its application in reading comprehension courses of academic texts written in English at university. Now, uh, the first question that we university teachers in Argentina asked ourselves was, why is it necessary to teach in a public university reading comprehension courses in English? Hello, Sandra. Uh, well, next, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Well, why is it necessary to teach it? Because English, whether we like it or not, <clears throat> is the lingua franca in the academy. Um, most of the scientific information we are acquainted with is written in English. English is the dominant language in the, um, in the sharing of scientific knowledge. So as future professionals, we need, um, we need to, to teach our uh, undergraduate students and even our graduate students to be acquainted with a possibility of reading English, uh, reading research articles written in English. And um, also students and postgraduate, uh, undergraduate and postgraduate students need to know the different jungles that are used in scientific uh, transmission of knowledge. Next, please. Um, the definition of, the, there are different theories that uh, deal with jungles. The, um, the theory I am I will be talking about is systemic functional linguistics. This um, this theory considers that language is a resource to build meanings, and uh, the grammar of the language gives you a system of networks, and you, as a writer or as a speaker, choose from the different possibilities the grammar gives you. Uh, a, ne a system network that you choose and use when you um, write a text or when you speak. Uh, meanings lie in these systemic models of elections and the system of language is realized in a text. That's to say, uh, you, the grammar, as I told you, uh, gives you the possibilities. You choose the possibilities and you write the text or you speak, because you also speak a text. Well, and um, this, uh, there is a relation between the text and its context that now we will uh, see in detail. Next, please. 
Thank you. According to this theory, the language has three basic metafunctions, interpersonal, ideational, and textual. All the languages, all the languages in their development develop these three metafunctions. The ideational metafunction is that metafunction that allows us to speak or, or to write about a subject, a topic. The interpersonal metafunction is the metafunction that allows us to choose certain options from the grammar to speak or write according to the relation of power that there are between the reader, the writer, between the speaker and the listening. You will not choose the same things if you are talking or to a superior, I mean a person with a different relation of power than you, or if you are talking or speaking or writing to a friend. And the textual metafunction is the one that organizes uh, the choices from, uh, done by the interpersonal and ideational metafunction into a text. So this is the text may be oral or maybe written. The next one, please. Thank you. Well, uh, all these ideas that I, I've mentioned belong to Halliday. Halliday, as you see, consider that language, this would be language, mm -hmm. phonology and lexical grammar, because the, he doesn't speak of lexis and grammar separately. They are all together. Semantics is not, um, is the basis of language. And then you have textual meanings, as I said, interpersonal meanings and experiential meanings that constitute the three metafunction of discourse, right? And finally, Halliday uh, also spoke of the two social contexts of language. One is the context of situation, this one that is here, uh, can you see the, the, the arrow? The textual meanings are uh, the, um, indicate the mode of the language, so to say written or oral. Then the interpersonal meanings, the tenor, and the experiential meanings, the field. Right? The next one, please. Well, Martin and Rose are disciples of, of uh, Halliday, and they speak of another context, social context, that's the context of culture. And they consider that jungles are here. That is the topic uh, of my presentation. They consider that every culture develops the jungles the culture needs. For example, uh, some, in some cases, some cultures that don't need um, academic jungles, but we do need, need them, right? But those jungles are in the culture, right? Well, the next one, please. The, yes. Bueno, what is jungle-based literacy pedagogy? Um, Rose and Martin, those um, holidays disciples, developed two projects in Australia, in the Sydney School, which is the linguistic department of, the, of Sydney University in Australia. They studied uh, language and education since they, they've been studying language and education since the 80s. And the main objective of this um, school is to develop a, a pedagogy that could allow students to be successful readers and writers in primary and secondary school. 
and uh, to design strategies to guide the teachers to facilitate the uh, acquisition of literacy by their students. And they consider that a jungle is a social process with a certain objective. What does it mean? That uh, you have it, it, it said all the jungle, each jungle has a, a, pro, uh, a project. And it has different steps. And we have to learn about it. Well, the next one, please. Why did they do that? Because the Australian context in the 80s was very difficult for migrant children and indigenous populations. You know that Australia is a country that received a lot of migrants and also there were a lot of indigenous populations and they were concentrated in the center of Australia. And in those primary schools, the, um, the children had a lot of difficulties to acquire the national language, which is English. And uh, so the first thing these uh, researchers do was to analyze and classify the school jungles that the children were asked for. And also to design the strategies that would, could help them. Yes, the next one, please. And they also criticized the Australian pedagogic paradigms because there were two paradigms that were being used in Australia in the 80s. One of them was the traditional approach that was teacher center. So what, what did teachers do? Well, they present a jungle and there was a monological lesson about the jungle characteristics. The, the teacher was a sort of expositor. And then they asked the, the children to write to, or to produce an example of that jungle. And the other uh, paradigm was a constructivist paradigm, following Vygotsky and his zone of proximal development. This paradigm was student-centered. And uh, they, um, they asked the students questions about their knowledge about uh, the different jungles. So they retrie the teachers retrieved previous knowledge uh, about jungles from the students. Then they gave them examples, and finally they asked for a written production of this jungle, of the jungle they studied. All right, the next one, please. Um, so they, they criticized, these uh, researchers criticized both paradigms. Why? I was surprised at what they said about Vygotsky, because I admired Vygotsky's position at that moment. I mean, when I read all these things produced by, by these uh, two researchers at the beginning of uh, this century. The thing is that they believed that the Vygotskyan approach was not adequate for um, for populations that were in an unf unfavorable social context. So they um, suggested another approach. It was a cyclic process. Uh, pass on to the next one, please. All right. Here you have this cyclic process. Can you see it? First, the the students were prepared for reading first. What, uh, this means that they try to retrieve the students' knowledge about the different genres and discuss with the teacher. And with the help of the teacher, they had to um, deconstruct the jungle. That's to say, to see what the steps the jungle had. Um, and then uh, 
they, together with the teacher, they produced or they, they began to read, in this case, an example of that jungle. Then they read in groups with their peers, other examples of the jungle. That is what they consider the joint reconstruction because they, the students worked in groups uh, together, of course, with the help, with the teacher's help. And finally, they were able to produce an individual construction of the jungle. Now, one of the, uh, if we go on with the cycle, when they did the detailed reading, they paid attention to the typical linguistic resources of the jungle. And then they uh, did the rewriting of what they, they read with a group of students, or perhaps first with the teacher and then with the group of students. And when they dominated the jungle, they were asked to produce an example of, uh, individually. So this was a constant, a constant cycling and recycling. The idea was that the student could uh, build his knowledge of this jungle. The next one, please. Right. Well, as I said before, they studied what jungles the students read in, uh, in primary school and in secondary school. Well, they found that most of the things they read and wrote about were stories. Mm -hmm. And why? Because what is the jungle we all know and what is the jungle we've been listening to or reading about since we were children? It was stories because you, to a little boy or girl, you read a story. So, in general, students know perfectly well the different steps in the story, that there, is a, there are characters in a certain place, that is a problem, and the problem is solved. Well, these people studied different types of stories um, that are everyday stories, and also they studied history, what they call histories that are autobiographies or biographies or a historical recount. It's a kind of uh, the biography of the different peoples in history. And these two jungles, the stories and his histories, were jungles the students were able to dominate. But what about explanations? Uh, the explanation of a sequence or to explain causes and effects. Well, this was not uh, very useful in primary school, at least. It is uh, useful, uh, it is used in um, secondary schools. The next one, please. In secondary school, they were asked to write about procedures, how to do something or how to use something, how to describe how to use something. And also reports, so to say, descriptions of classification and descriptions of phenomena and arguments. In, our, in the case of arguments, they made a very interesting um, difference between three types of argumentation. The one, the first one, <coughs> was called exposition. That to say the kind of argumentation where you establish a thesis and you defend it with arguments. Then the second one, the debate, when you have two or three positions and the author either uh, defends one and destroys the other or um, defends a combination of, of the three of them. Etc. There are different possibilities. And the challenge, that is when you want to destroy 
other position because you you disagree absolutely with it. And also they found text responses, reviews, interpretations, or critical responses to the text. But all these, all these genres were not studied seriously in secondary education. I can tell you that the, the situation in primary and secondary schools in Argentina is quite similar. Hmm? All right, the next one, please. Well, the thing is, in higher education, can we apply this approach to reading comprehension courses in higher education? We thought we can. And so, the, what I am going to talk about is a, a, a case, a simple case in um, the School of Philosophy and Letters in the University of Buenos Aires. In the English reading courses, we receive students with a very, very basic knowledge of English. The 80% of the, of the students are A1, have the knowledge of English of A1. 18% um, A2, approximately, and only 2% B1. The rest of them who have a, a, a better knowledge of English generally sit for independent exams and well, they pass the exam. Not always, but in general they do. But in the regular courses, the, the courses the students attend, we have students with an A1 and an A2 level, very low level of English. And so in three semesters with uh, lessons of four hours a week, we, they have to finish the three uh, courses uh, reading a, re a complete research article from the humanities in English. But they produce their summaries or any kind of exercises or tasks in Spanish. And the texts are academic texts in the area of humanities. Because in the School of Philosophy and Letters, they study nine fields of studies, history, geography, education, philosophy, letters, anthropology, librarianship, and edition. There are nine, nine fields of study. And uh, the genres that are generally used in the humanities are narratives, descriptions, debates, and challenges, which are the most difficult ones, especially debates. And so what we do is when we teach English for specific purposes, and this is what we do, we contribute to the development of their academic literacy. All right, the next one, please. Well, in, um, as we had this kind of uh, students, we had to develop uh, a model of reading. A model of reading, and I, we are, I am going to concentrate on the cognitive area of this model of reading, that's to say the pre-reading stage, uh, the preparation for reading. Um, the pre-reading stage is very important because it's the moment when students generate a specific and um, general reading hypothesis about the text. And these have, if these hypotheses are correct, they, uh, these hypotheses guide them in their reading and in a final rec personal reconstruction of the text. And in this uh, pre-reading stage, that it, the paratext, that is what surrounds the text, and the organizational signals are fundamental to anticipate the text. Um, and to, to anticipate not only the text content, but also the genre of the text. And this uh, facilitates then their reading because they are prepared to read 
certain jungle, and if they know the, the steps of the jungle, they will find it uh, easier to read these uh, texts. All right, the next one, please. We are going to work with some examples. For example, in uh, if you want, you can write in the chat the answer to this question so that can participate a little. For example, in this paratext, that's to say the title, and here also we have, uh, we teach them uh, how you, you write the references of the text. We have, uh, the author is Caroline Rye, the title of the articles in Havana and Paris, the musical activities of Alejo Carpentier. Music and letters. This is the, the, the journal where it was published. And then the characteristics of the journal. And we have also the, the year of the presentation, 2008. And what information about the text content can we anticipate? What do you think the text is about? The experiential meaning. Probably the students will, will write, uh, will say, well, it's about music, but music and letter, why music and letters? And uh, then some other student may say, because it's a, it's a text about Alejo Carpentier, Perhaps young people don't know him very much, but the people in letters, as we have mixed groups of students, they are from different uh, courses of study, probably the, the people from letters Im will immediately say, well, he was a Cuban writer who wrote at the beginning of the 20th century and so on. And uh, the other question we generally ask is, is what do you think the text will be about? Probably the students will say, well, about, uh, I didn't know, one student may say that Alejo Carpentier was also a musician, perhaps some connection between music and, and his writings. Well, all right. And uh, is the other question we can say, is English the writer's mother tongue? We don't know because we don't have here information about the author, right? Perhaps it isn't. Perhaps it is. We don't know. Well, the next one, please. All right. And here is the abstract. This is the only thing we are going to see about the, the, the four uh, texts. If you can read the, 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 the abstract, you will be able to answer the question, can you anticipate the genre of this article? I mean, is it a narration? Is it a biography? Is it an autobiography? Is it an explanation? Is it an argumentation? And, um, the other thing we generally ask is look for linguistic elements that can help you distinguish what jungle the text is about. And we'll see the next one, please. Well, here we, we see that uh, I highlighted some phrases Cuban writer Alejo Carpentier, during his creative apprenticeship in the interwar years, in 1920s Havana, after being forced to flee Havana, during his 11-year residence in Paris, 1928-39, all these are marks of a biography. So they will probably say this is this text is a biographical text. It's a text that is about the, the life of Alejo Carpentier. Yes, the next one, please. 
Yes, yes, yes. Good, good. Sandra and the other. Fine. Thank you for the contributions. Now, again, um, well, here we have, in this tendency, next text, we have organizational signals. You know what they are? For example, the author biography. Uh, in this text, the author is Obiegbu, Ifejina, Ishingwa, Rita. Uh, the article was uh, written in 2018. The title is Reading Errors in Second Language Learners. And uh, in, with, only with that, can you anticipate the text content? I mean, what the text, if it, if it belongs to geography, to history, to education, to philosophy, only with the title. What do you think? Reading Errors in Second Language Learners. It was published in Sage Open. Sage Open doesn't say much, but uh, the title. What field is it? Probably it's students, because we, we have education students, will say it's, it's an educational article. Yes, that's right, Angle, Angie, sorry. And what about the, um, the author's biography? Is English her mother tongue? She's a senior lecturer in English language at the Department of English and Literary Studies of the University of Nigeria. She has done several research studies on reading errors in second language situation. What do you think is English her mother tongue. Do you know what language is Nigeria's uh, national language? Well, the national language is English, but but there are lots of indigenous languages. So probably this author, and this is all the conversation we have with the students. English is not her national her mother tongue. Probably English is the language she uses in, because it's a national language in Nigeria. All right, the next one, please. All right. Uh, well, here you have the abstract that is another organizational signal and also have other things, keywords hmm, that you write when you, when you write a, a, a research paper, you write the abstract and also keywords. The keywords are linguistic factors, reading competence, second language learners, reading error, extensive reading. So if we read the abstract, if we have time to read the abstract, uh, it says, or even if we don't, only with the keywords. Can you anticipate the text topic, what, what the article will be about? Probably, uh, we have teachers there, they will say, well, about education, of course, of course, yes. And especially, as we said, as we saw in the title, reading errors. And the next uh, slide, please. All right. I, um, this is a joint deconstruction that the teacher and the, uh, and the students can make. I marked certain parts in this text. This study posits that there are divergent positions among scholars regarding the roles of experiential and linguistic factors in reading incompetence among second language readers. This is what, this is the problem. That's why it's an explanation with problem solution uh, order. There are divergent positions about the role 
for the importance of experiential and linguistic factors in reading incompetence and problems of reading among second language readers. This study was conducted with a view to determining the exact sources of reading errors. So this is the aim of the person who does the study. The goal, again the aim, was to suggest the strategies of reading improvement. Hmm? Um, and she, she did an experiment and the results show that reading competence was typically low in Nigeria. However, it is significant that linguistic inadequacies accounted for the bulk of the reading errors identified. So the problem was linguistic, according to this writing. And so she suggests, I, it says this study advocates, uh, an approach to reading instruction which emphasizes extensive reading. So there was a problem. She, she organized an experiment and she discovered that uh, one of these factors was the, the one for uh, the problems in reading. Mm -hmm. That was the lack of language, language knowledge. Okay, the next one, please. This is another jungle, so let's see another. Um, Moreno Maria Jose, Art Museums and the Internet, Emergence of the Virtual Museum in Music and Letters. This is, uh, again, the journal, volume 89, da, da, da. Maria Jose Moreno, Department of Social Sciences, College of General Studies, University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras Campus, Puerto Rico. So, Art Museums and the Internet is the title, The Emergence of the Virtual Museum. Uh, what is the topic then? Is it, uh, it belongs to what area of knowledge? Hmm? Probably what? It's not music, but it's connected with art, because art museum. All right, and uh, what about the author? Is English her mother tongue? This is from Puerto Rico, so you, you can... In one of the presentations... Uh, yes, Anna, of course. Of course. Uh, one of the presentations today or yesterday, I don't remember, it was about the, no, I think it was today, uh, was about the disadvantage of people who speak Creole in Puerto Rico. So probably this uh, Maria Jose Moreno could have that problem because although English is used, this uh, uh, Creole is a, uh, the people who speak Creole in Puerto Rico are disregarded. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next one, please. Uh, here we have the abstract. The internet has brought about the birth of a new cultural space, the virtual museum. This essay, can you, uh, see how this, the, there are certain phrases that are repeated. This essay examines how placing the museum in cyberspace redefines the functions of the museum and the relations between the museums, the art object and the public. It is argued that, that virtual museums are paradoxical spaces, while the digital format of virtual museums permits an alteration of the conventional views and relations existing in the traditional museum, the limited availability of internet technology ties the virtual museum to the established power structures that have characterized the real art world. 
Okay. Uh, the next one, please. Here, perhaps, if you are not trained, it's difficult to, to anticipate the, uh, the genre from the abstract. But here it says what the, uh, here. It is argued that the virtual, that virtual museums are paradoxical spaces. This word, argue, is the one that indicates that there may be some sort of argumentation. While, while the digital form of virtual museum permits an alteration of the conventional views and relations existing in the traditional museum, one idea, the limited availability of internet technology tiles the virtual museum to the established power structure. So she agrees but with the idea that virtual museums are paradoxical spaces. And then she gives her arguments. Virtual museums are fantastic because it permits uh, the changes in the, in the views and relations that exist between uh, the museum and the people. But also, and this is why paradoxical, the tradition, the, the limited availability of the internet in many areas of our planet uh, make it difficult for people to access to virtual museums. Hmm? Okay, the next one, please. Um, and finally, let's see this one. Scott McLean in 2007, the university extension and social change, positioning a university of the people in Saskatchewan. It was published in Adult Education Quarterly. Scott McLean is the director of continuing education and a professor of sociology at the University of Calgary, Canada. Well, this is easier to anticipate the, uh, the topic or the text content. What will this article be about? Yes, <laughs> obviously about education. And uh, what about the author? Is English his mother tongue? Remember that in Canada, the, uh, they speak two languages, French and English. Maybe one of them, of these uh, uh, languages is his mother tongue. We don't know. All right, the next one. Well, here it says that there are two predominant interpretations of the history of Canadian university extension. Universities in, in, universities in general uh, have extension programs for adults, which are very interesting. And uh, the two interpretations are the liberal or institutional that uh, considers that extension has been a means for universities to disseminate resources, foster progress in societies, and meet the learning needs of the individual. And the critical or nostalgic perspective claims that university extension once resisted dominant forms of uh, power relation, but now supports such relations. Well, this article again challenges these two interpretations. Be careful, challenges. This is what we have to notice. Evidently, this will be a challenge because he's going. Uh, challenges these two interpretations. He is against the two interpretations. And then um, the article, uh, he says that, uh, objection, that these interpretations are incorrect, right? Well, can you, uh, the next one, please? Okay, here is what uh, I mentioned this, the article cha challenges, and the author argues that the evolution of um, 
university extension in this university was influence the changes to the mode of production in the province. So he's against the two previous interpretations and he says that the changes were due to the, the changes in modes of production. All right, the next one. Well, what are the conclusions? Uh, I try to show you that English is academia lingua franca, and that's why we find it necessary in our universities to teach uh, reading comprehension courses, because people, most of the 90% of the papers that we read at the universities are written in English. Uh, so students have to, to, to be able to understand them because it's the only possibility to go on learning and to go on belonging to the academy, right? And uh, jungle-based literacy pedagogy, we think that the philosophy of letters is a powerful tool to help students acquire academic literacy. Well, the next one. Okay, I wanted to share with you, if you are interested in reading comprehension or in reading in general, some um, uh, journals that are free. One of them, uh, and you can read a lot of articles on reading. One of them is reading in a foreign language from the University of Hawaii. They are free. You write University of Hawaii and you will find the, uh, the journal reading in a foreign language. You don't have to pay anything. And then we, in our TESO, in our association, we have an ESP journal and an EFL journal. This is not, um, the ESP journal perhaps is more concentrated on reading, but the EFL journal is about the four macro abilities. These are free also. And uh, there is um, a, one publication, one issue from the uh, Revista Traslaciones, published by the Uni uh, National University of Cuyo in Argentina, that has just published uh, a journal on modern languages. So uh, you can find also interesting articles there. All right, the next one, please. Thank you. This is, uh, thank you for waiting for, <laughs> for me. All right. Well, that's all. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Gonzalez, for your presentation. We will now open the floor for questions. Remember that you can write your questions in the chat box, and let's try to keep those as concisely as possible, and we will transfer those to our specialists. We have some comments here. Um, reading is a process. Sometimes we forget to include pre-reading activities. All right, and you know that this is also a problem in uh, not only in university, uh, but also my 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 daughter is a teacher, a kindergarten teacher. And uh, when she reads uh, uh, narratives to children, I always tell her, show the, the, um, the cover of the book and ask the children, well, when they can speak, because if you, if you, if you work with, uh, with children uh, of three, four, and five years, they can speak. And ask them, what do they think they are going to read about? of course, with very simple language. Because it, these pre-reading activities are very often not considered even in people who are in education. I don't know why, but I, uh, in my case, I, am, I specialized in reading. I, I don't understand why uh, they don't uh, work on that. Yes, I agree. You have to begin with pre-reading activities, but not only activating previous knowledge, as all the textbooks say, but also 
thinking about the organization of the text you are going to read. Hmm? Because, uh, yes, you activate previous knowledge and then you don't go down to the text. You don't go to the title or to relate the title with some pictures to sort of hypothesize about the text genre and the text content. It, it's a pity, but it, you're right. You, very often it, it, these activities are not considered. Of course, and they are very, very important indeed. Um, we have another comment here. Uh, this type of text analysis is useful to teach reading strategies, and it also helps students of EAP. Yes, definitely. Definitely uh, because, yes. Yes, please go ahead. Because reflecting on the, on the jungles, uh, when you speak with, uh, when you work like this at university, you are surprised because uh, students generally don't reflect on the orga on the rhetorical organization or on the or as uh, the systemic say steps of the of the genre. So they cannot produce appropriate text. University students, I remember when I was studying at university. The first time they asked me to write a monography, I didn't know how to write it. I mean, and I, I, I remember that uh, I wrote one that was quite good in a way, as a as content, but the teacher told me, listen, but you, you didn't write an introduction. You jumped into the text. She was right. I didn't even write a, a single sentence for an introduction. So I didn't know how this uh, genre is organized. But nobody, no, nobody made me reflect on that. Hmm? Of course. Okay. Of course. Yes. We have another comment that says, sometimes there's no time. We go straight to the reading comprehension activity without activating previous knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yes, but you know, if you activate previous knowledge, not only related to the content, but also to the type of text or the genre or the discursive genre, you facilitate reading. And so the reading comprehension step, is, that to say the second, the wild reading stage, is easier for the students because you Absolutely. activated a lot of hypotheses. And so they, they begin reading with a lot of hypotheses. So comprehension is easier. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. We we'll have uh, a comment about sectioning the texts with activities, which can also promote uh, their eagerness to read further. Yes, and yes. And if, uh, when, you, when you read a long text, for example, uh, you know that now it's difficult to make people read, but if you mm -hmm read part of it one class and you stop in a, in a very poor in a moment when there is a, some sort of tension they will be eager to go on reading hmm? yes you can definitely body bathe and um, it helps them choose which articles to read when doing research it saves them time just by reading the abstracts of course well this is an anticipatory uh, um, strategy you have thousands of articles to read, and you choose which to read, only reading the abstract. Yes. And we have a comment here. I like how the information provided from references can also um, arise so many possible topics to discuss with students. And there are so many activities uh, one can do as well. Of course. Yes, yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for all your insights, uh, Ms. Maria Susana Gonzalez. We are sure they will be very useful uh, in everybody's teaching practice. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Now, before uh, we break for the day, we would like to make a few announcements. Remember that in order to receive the certificate, you must have attended 24 hours. 
a total of 24 hour, hours. When the certificates are ready, you will be informed by email. You will have the option of receiving a digital certificate or a paper one. And you will be sent an evaluation form so you can provide us with feedback that will be sent to your email address. So please make sure that you complete that and provide us with your valuable feedback. So we have come to the end of our seminar, embracing an inclusive education in practice. From the curriculum to regulation, trends, digital literacies and assessment. To all of those speakers who joined us in person, have a safe return to your countries. To all of you, thank you for joining us. And it's been an honor having all of all you as our guests. Have a great afternoon. Thank you very much.